Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, please remember to sign the attendance record and also please remember to fill out and uh, return the program evaluations and give us any ideas in regards to future topics or future speakers. Uh, today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Jared Tucker. Uh, Dr. Tucker is a native Iowan. He attended to his undergraduate uh, training here at Iowa State where he got to his BA in psychology. He then uh, did a pre-doctoral internship uh, at Cambridge Health Partners Harvard Medical School before returning to Iowa State where he received his PhD in counseling psychology. Uh, he is uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Behavioral Medicine at Des Moines University and since last month uh, he has been the clinical psychologist here at the uh, Cancer Research or Resource Center uh, at Mary Greeley and uh, he kindly has accepted our invitation today to provide us with uh, uh, an education on uh, integrating psycho-oncology and cancer care. Uh, you provide us with updates and best practices, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Jared Tucker. Thank you so much, Dr. All right, can you hear me okay? It's coming through? Uh, I'm getting used to being half human, half machine here, so um, hopefully I will master the technology before the end of the day. Uh, but thank you so much for the introduction, and it's, it really is an honor to be a part and giving of Mary Greeley and giving this presentation. And my main goals, I have two overarching goals along with the sort of individual competencies that I'm hoping to, to provide. One is to just introduce myself uh, as a psychologist to give you a feel of what psychology is about um, and what psychologists can do in an integrated healthcare setting. Uh, so that if you're making that referral, you can kind of know who you're referring to uh, and maybe having some confidence in that referral. Because uh, certainly the, the, the confidence that we have in who we're referring to can impact the likelihood that somebody's going to follow through. Um, and to also kind of broadly introduce psycho-oncology, but also thinking about how can this be integrated into other uh, departments uh, here at the hospital. Um, so, so, my main goals for the end of the day, the kind of three primary objectives. First are to give you some updated data on behavioral, psychological, and psychiatric aspects of cancer risk and treatment. So thinking about what contributes to the incidence of, of cancer from a psychosocial perspective what contributes to proper screening and treatment, and then also the sort of physical and psychological uh, components of cancer care uh, that are a, a big part of, of, of health outcomes uh, and, be, and the importance of behavior change. Uh, give you a little bit of an understanding around uh, the role and utility of psychotherapeutic treatments and screening. So my hope is to give uh, you a little bit of a sense of how to do screening and how to do assessments in the clinic, in the room, in the limited time that you might have uh, to make referrals. And along that line is sort of some of the COC guidelines uh, for patient care. Uh, so we'll try applying it to a case example and thinking about how that might look. So that's a big agenda, uh, but I do really hope that this can be kind of an informal dialogue. So if things are coming up for you as I'm speaking and presenting and you have questions you'd like to interject with, uh, I'm very much attentive to uh, having some tangential circum substantial reasoning here as we go off on different uh, directions. All right. So my, many of you might already be familiar with the cognitive and behavioral risk factors of cancer. Um, as a psychologist, it's pretty uh, surprising and Im impactful to, to look at the behavior components of what contributes to, to cancer risk. So we know, uh, by and large, so cancer, of course, is the result of, of multiple mutations in the genes responsible for proliferation and repair um, and death of cells. However, what contributes to those mutations are largely environmental. So Anand and colleagues in 2008 had this really compelling narrative about the importance of uh, environmental exposure, the importance of diet, the importance of tobacco, the importance of exercise, physical activity, in the prevalence rates of, of cancer. Uh, and this is true with most care conditions that we're working with today. Um, so across the board, uh, social environmental factors contribute usually the most, uh, the largest percentage to the incidence rates of many disease states, uh, followed closely behind by behaviors, followed then by clinical care, access and quality of care, uh, and then physical environment. And genetics can play a, a greater or lesser extent. And in cancer, the, the uh, incidence rates that are attributed directly to genetic inheritance are fairly small which is surprising for some. About 90 to 95% of cancer incidence is due to environmental factors. So what do we do with that? Um, 
rather than thinking of that in terms of uh, this is a willpower issue for the patients that we're seeing, or this is uh, a, a, a deficit in character or something like that, what a, a psychologist's role is really to just explore the many things that contribute to a uh, person's dietary choices, to their exercise regimens, uh, to the choice to smoke or not smoke, and to work with folks around all the motivational factors that go into, into play. So for example, with tobacco, uh, we know that smoking cessations or stopping smoking doesn't necessarily decrease your absolute risk, but it certainly stops the dramatic increase in risk that occurs over the lifespan by continued smoking. So stopping at, at smoking at age 30 can add about nine to 10 years of life expectancy, but stopping at age 60 can also add about three years of life expectancy. And that's important because not only does it increase uh, life expectancy, but continuing to smoking past the a diagnosis can interfere with other forms of treatment, the efficacy of chemotherapy, uh, increase infection rate, likelihood of infection, uh, contribute to oral mucositis, and other kind of side effect profiles. And actually, Dr. Rudapatna gave a great presentation that I had a chance to, to look through um, on the Mary Greeley uh, YouTube channel, where he talks a lot about some of the adverse effects of immunotherapy and how social uh, factors contribute to those and are also a part of that picture. So by helping patients to, to stop smoking or to go uh, engage in smoking cessation, we can really dramatically alter the, the course of the illness. When it comes to diet, we know that there's certainly in increased risk related to specific foods. Um, especially around um, processed meats and preserved meats, thinking about incre increasing risk. But it's also much more about dietary patterns and habits to increase overall protective factors for somebody um, to decrease incidence. So basically all of this is to say that what contributes to change around these behaviors is very, it's a very complicated picture. It's not something that is easy to saying, let's increase your, your exercise, let's improve your diet. Uh, it's much more about habits and patterns in lifestyle. So as an example, when it comes to dieting, uh, there's a couple of reasons why dieting generally doesn't work. First of all, right, when we think about dieting, if we have a big emphasis on restricting food intake, we have a big emphasis on limiting or, or stopping t uh, eating a particular food uh, specifically, that can really increase somebody's uh, hyperfocus um, on uh, maintaining the ideal weight. Uh, it can contribute to preoccupation, and on the low end, it can be contribute to orthorexia, where we're just having hyperfocus on being healthy. And on the extreme end, it can lead to disordered eating and disordered body image. Right when we're kind of engaging this process of restricting, and then over time, we have necessarily the compensatory response we've been restricting for so long. We might binge or we might break our diet, and now we feel guilty about having done that, and then that guilt contributes to greater restriction, which, makes, which is impossible to maintain, which then we again, and the cycle continues going forward. And interestingly enough, dieting doesn't work, um, for better or worse. So even the most intensive dieting uh, and supported dieting regimens, where we're having folks restrict to around 1,600 to 1,700 calorie caloric intake, we're having them go through weekly CBT. We're having them try and exercise four or five times per week. Ultimately, uh, folks can lose weight. Uh, they can lose about 10% uh, of their weight within about the six month period. But about a third of that returns at the end of the year. And then within five years, about 100% of that weight has been regained, right? And it's because these things have not been integrated into an individual's life. These changes have not been integrated into the way that they're living their lives. Uh, it, it hasn't been integrated into their motivations for change. Um, it hasn't been maybe necessarily fully explored uh, for, for that person. They're not intrinsically motivated. When it comes to exercise, the problem with exercise is that, you know, we focus so much on 30 minutes of exercise a day, uh, you know, five times a week to kind of meet certain guidelines or, or recommendations. But that 30 minutes doesn't really say anything about the rest of our day. Uh, when, if we're being sedentary for 23 and a half hours and we're exercising for half an hour. Um, so what's more important than that is something is just more general physical activity, right? So rather than, I mean, when I ask you all to exercise or I su suggest that you should exercise, um, does anybody really enjoy that process? Like just the word exercise, does that sound compelling to you? 
Like for me as a person, the idea of forcing myself to exercise, you know, it becomes like this have to, it becomes a must. It becomes something that I kind of want to avoid. And then if I avoid it, I feel bad about having not exercised that day. Uh, and it's not necessarily a positive feeling around exercise. Uh, it's, not a it's not an intrinsically motivating phenomenon. What instead what we really focused on, uh, and this is sort of a part of the health at every size movement, uh, but basically what we want to instead focus on is physical activity and embodiment of physical activity in our day-to-day -day life, right? And this is actually where it takes a little bit more time. So how many have already been trained in something like motivational interviewing or around those techniques? Okay, so a few in the room. So basically, motivational interviewing is a, is a process of not prejudging our patients and saying, here's what you need to do, uh, here's the regimen, do it. It's much more about the process of understanding what are the individual barriers to engaging that behavior? Why would you even want to do this? For what reason do you want to exercise? Why is it important to you? It's probably not because you, know, you want to impress your physician or you want to impress your psychologist. Uh, why would you actually want to engage in that? And, it, and it's a very individual experience for each, indi each person. It might be because you know, for, I want to model this for my children. I don't want my children to kind of live a lifestyle. Or um, whatever it is about that person's uh, motivations, intrinsic motivations. So motivational interviewing and, and psychology generally tries to help work with a person to integrate these things into the way that they experience the world, physical embodiment as opposed to exercise. Right? And we find that that much more, is much more effective if we focus on body acceptance, if we focus on active embodiment, and if we focus on intuitive eating, something where you're just sort of recognizing when you're feeling full. You're attending to your inner experience, uh, mindful eating, those sorts of things, rather than trying to really restrict um, or maintain a specific diet. These tend to be much better uh, able to be integrated into, the, into our patients' lives and lived experience. So psychosocial factors, certainly, uh, just a note here about the role of depression, stress, and personality in cancer risk. Uh, I think a lot of patients sometimes might worry about the impact of feeling down or the impact of feeling anxious, and is that going to make my symptoms worse? Um, or is that gonna, am I somehow to blame because of my personality factors? Uh, no, basically. The, the research is pretty compelling. There's not a real clear link between depression, stress, personality, and cancer risk. Um, you know, this is across multiple large-scale studies. Uh, you're not going to give yourself cancer by worrying. So we can maybe put our, our patients at ease a little bit by that. However, psychosocial factors do predict other things that are linked to, to cancer incidence. So for example, there's a very high comorbidity between mental health and substance use. Um, in fact, sometimes you know, when I teach students at DMU, I often say, basically, you should probably assume that the patients that you're working with in psychiatry have some sort of substance use concern. That is a much more accurate, uh, some, if you're going to make an assumption one way or the other, that's usually the more accurate assumption. And there's a lot of uh, neurological reasons why that is the case, biochemical reasons. Um, but for example, in bipolar disorder, the uh, comorbidity around nicotine use is around 70%, right? So it's very high use rates. Um, and the correlation of adverse childhood events, meaning early trauma in our lives can relate to the incidence of obesity. And these things are independent risk factors. So social factors are psychosocial factors are important, but it's not as though our patients are going to worry themselves uh, into developing cancer. So as a psychologist, another thing that we do is really t attend to various um, experiences around uh, cognition and processing of health information that might be a part of their decision to seek treatment and to get proper screening and those sorts of things. So this is not, you know, this is a lot of detail. What's more important here that I'm hoping to kind of compel you around is that there are a lot of things that uh, can contribute to somebody's desire to seek more information about their illness, their motivation or their beliefs about what their ability to control their illness, um, their emotions, uh, and their self-regulatory uh, capacities here. So just as an example, let's take uh, to uh, folks who I borrowed from uh, Picard, and we'll compare them to one another. Fictional Beth and fictional Anne. Uh, I'm sure they're lovely individuals in person, but uh, I don't know who they are. So, um, but let's let's take a look at Beth. Let's take a look at Anne. Let's imagine for on the, at the level of encoding. So Beth and Anne both have, let's say, the same risk profile for for developing cancer. 
Uh, they both had a, a, a mother who was diagnosed with breast cancer um, who underwent chemotherapy and treatment. They both have the same risk factors in terms of obesity, uh, smoking, etc. But they might differ in terms of how they experience the illness. So Beth, maybe, let's say in her, in her primary family, her mother was very, felt very stigmatized for her breast cancer. So she didn't want to drink out of the same glass as another woman in her family for fear that she might give that person her breast cancer. Certainly not an accurate view, but one that her mom might have possessed. Whereas Anne, on the other hand, was always told that she had a very healthy immune system. I was always told I had a very healthy immune system, but I have no evidence to support that belief. Um, so what does that mean? So Anne has this view that she has a very healthy immune system. And that might impact, even though they have the same risk factors, their desire to get screened early, uh, their desire to uh, undergo treatment, um, and their ultimate trajectory uh, around their illness pathway. Uh, so Anne, let's say but also, however, that Beth also has a lot of anxiety or worry. Um, so even though she's thinking that she's very uh, at risk for developing cancer, her mom talked about it a lot, she's really nervous about what that might mean for her. So her emotions around it, she's feeling very anxious. She doesn't feel like she has a lot of skill to regulate the feelings of having cancer. And so therefore she avoids getting proper treatment. Anne and Beth both avoid. Anne avoids it because she doesn't think she's at risk because she's got a great immune system. And Beth avoids it because of this anxiety. So basically, just to say that these are factors that can go into screening and treatment. And it's something that we might want to attend to uh, as a psychologist or as a, a healthcare provider. Now, hopefully what I'm doing in this presentation is slowly motivating your belief that psychosocial factors are important, whether or not you feel like you can actually integrate them into the time that you have with patients. Um, if you feel like you can't, perhaps a psychologist might be warranted. So uh, I don't have any financial disclosures for this presentation, but I do have a slight bias that psychology is warranted. So keep that in mind as I'm going through. Um, so common concerns. Uh, you know, very early on, the, the World Health Organization talked about um, the role and importance of mental health. You know, that without mental health, there can be no true physical health. And that's something I, I generally believe. With cancer treatments, I won't get into real specifics, but with cancer treatments, there's so much that goes on around physical symptoms, nausea, fatigue, pain, that relate to uh, psychosocial factors. So I'll just talk a little bit about those briefly here. So with pain, you know, about 70% of patients experience severe pain at some point during treatment. Pain is, is is a physical phenomenon. Certainly, it's nociceptive cells that are sending brains through the dorsal horn to our central nervous system to tell us we're in pain. But it's also uh, a, a psychological phenomenon. Cognitive and emotional processes, personality, social factors can all mediate the experience of pain. Um, so ideally, in the treatment of pain, we want to integrate both a biological perspective and a psychological perspective. What they found is that relaxation techniques, mindfulness techniques, assertiveness skills actually can really help uh, patients in the experience of pain. So that their actual subjective experience of pain um, is reduced. With nausea, um, certainly a lot of this, you know, a pathogenesis-based approach is best. We want to focus on the etiology of that nausea. You know, it could be chemotherapy is impacting the medulla which is the vomit center of the brain, and telling us that we're, uh, we're nauseous, there's some, uh, something to get rid of in the body. But there's also higher cortical brain areas that kind of communicate with the medulla to tell us the experience, or that translate to the experience of nausea. And that's where, again, psycho psychologists or mental health providers can be important in providing progressive muscle relaxation, systematic desensitization, et cetera. So systematic desensitization, for example, is there's a lot of anticipatory nausea that goes on, right? When, you're, uh, when you've been sick every time you've gone into the uh, chemotherapy room and there's sort of an association, there's actually an anticipatory nausea that can go on before you've even gotten to the room, right? You've associated all the stimuli, the smell, the, the presence, uh, and that can make you nauseous. Uh, systematic desensitization can be being in that stressful environment and uh, engaging in progressive muscle relaxation or another relaxation technique because basically it's impossible to be both 
uh, stressed and relaxed at the same time, right? So we're training our, our, our patients uh, to induce sort of relaxation, even in the face of stress. Fatigue, uh, certainly multifactorial. It's very common and sometimes reported as the most distressing part of cancer treatment. Uh, CBT, mindfulness acceptance, behavior planning, all of these things are helpful in uh, addressing fatigue. Some of it is changing our expectations for our bodies, for ourselves uh, in cancer treatment. Uh, some of it is grieving the loss of previous ways of existing in the world. And all of that goes into sort of changing our patterns and the, the, our lived experience. Um, sleep hygiene is very, very beneficial even in fatigue. Sometimes those factors around you know, going to bed at the same time every night, making sure that you're associating your bed with sleep uh, and only sleep. Um, those sorts of things can be beneficial. And finally, so there's uh, one of the things that we do as psychologists is we, we try to be very aware of the fact that uh, cancer treatment is hard, it's stressful. Um, that sometimes it's not because you have a, a depressed uh, episode. It's not, sometimes it's not because you have a generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, it's because you, maybe there's some reactive grief that's going on. It's a very difficult adjustment period. So we're, we try to be very intentional about not jumping to conclusions around diagnosis. So we usually make sure to spend not just one evaluation, but a couple of evaluations, sometimes three evaluations before making the proper diagnosis around some of these things. That being said, uh, the prevalence rates of mental illness in cancer patients is, is fairly high. So adjustment disorders, which are basically not the level of post-traumatic stress, but I've got this stressor in my life, and I'm now having difficulty adjusting uh, more so than uh, kind of what would be typical. Those are about 40 times more prevalent than in the general population. PTSD is about two times as prevalent. Depressive disorders are about three times as prevalent. And suicide is about twice as high uh, compared to the general population, with the greatest risk being within the first year after diagnosis. So this is a lot of what my work does. Uh, what I focus on is in the treatment and management of these comorbid, co-occurring uh, mental uh, health concerns. And there's a lot of treatments uh, that are evidence-based around these things. I, I won't go into all of them in particular, because that's about five years worth of a PhD. Uh, however, uh, I do want to give you just a general sense of their efficacy and how they can be use, uh, useful. So overall, and this, you know, hopefully this is like earth shattering for you, and you're like, what? Mind blown. Um, and if not, we can talk about it. But psychotherapy is very, very effective. It has an effect size. This is really robust finding in the literature since the 1980s. It has an effect size of about 0.8, so meaning that 80% of people who go through therapy are better off than those who don't. That means also that if you draw the standard distribution of folks who, the general population and folks who seek therapy, it's about a one, almost a one standard deviation shift, which is a pretty big change. Let's compare that to some other treatments. So sometimes the way that this is categorized is the numbers needed to treat. Um, meaning that if you, in order for you to see some benefit for a, a treatment, you would need to uh, have this many patients, right? So for psychotherapy, the number needed to treat is about three, meaning that if you treat three people, one of them is going to benefit pretty confidently. If we look at some of the other kind of very well-established medical treatments, uh, com compression stockings uh, post-surgery, the number needed to treat is about seven. Antibiotics and uh, sinusitis, about 19. Statins, 125. Aspirin, 129, prevention of heart attacks, right? And prophylactic aspirin, they actually stopped the study because they felt like keeping it from the control group was unethical, right? They actually felt like, oh man, we actually have to stop the study because this is so beneficial for patients that we should, it's unethical for us to not give prophylactic aspirin to the other group. We don't really do that with therapy, right? We don't necessarily see it as unethical to withhold therapy, even though it's a very well-established uh, treatment in terms of efficacy. overall, a uh, number needed to treat of less than five is generally associated with a meaningful health benefit. Number needed to treat of greater than 15 is associated with, at most, a small net health benefit, but still a benefit. Anybody like, oh yeah, I know that? Anybody like, what? 
I'm surprised. Okay, good. <laughs> Maybe we can talk about it afterwards. Um, so yeah, so therapy is effective. I mean, I, I, I think when you're thinking about giving a referral to a therapist or a mental health counselor, it's good to know uh, that therapy is effective. You can have confidence in your referral for most folks are gonna benefit. And also knowing the side effect profile is pretty small. Uh, there's not a lot of negatives other than the fact that you have to talk about your emotions, um, which is troublesome for some of us, me included. But um, there's a very, very little side effects, right? And this is across conditions. This is across conditions, across treatment modalities. You know, there's a million treatment modalities out there. There's psychoanalytic, psychodynamic, cognitive behavioral, acceptance commitment, emotion focus, interpersonal, interpersonal process. It, it goes on. There's 400 or more. But it doesn't matter. The specific treatment that you provide is about this important in terms of the relationship with the therapist the, and the general processes that go on, which is exploring topics that we normally avoid. Um, and getting support and having somebody with us as we go through that process. All right, and also there's a motivational window. I'm really proud of this slide. Um, it's just very beautiful. Um, but So there's a motivational window that comes with a cancer diagnosis. Uh, so we've all probably heard of post-traumatic stress, but maybe we haven't talked as much about post-traumatic growth, right? That there is this real phenomenon of uh, or opportunity around authenticity and living that comes with facing death. Um, that death is, when it comes to avoidance, avoidance is perhaps the most basic human reaction to stress, and it's so pervasive. Uh, perhaps we're not, the, most thing, the thing we're most avoidant of uh, is around death and dying. And uh, in that process of uh, exploring death and dying is a real opportunity for, for growth. And that's why, like for example, in Kubler-Ross model, you may have heard of the stages of grieving. Um, you know, denial might be the first thing, avoidance might be the first thing. But acceptance and um, appreciation of and meaning finding is also in that process. So there's a motivational window that occurs. So, you know, in the general population, when it comes to smoking cessation, relapse usually occurs within a week. With cancer patients, it's a little longer, around three months period. So they're able to maintain that initial uh, cessation for longer periods. There's a motivation, there's an opportunity for us here to capitalize uh, through treatment. Uh, I won't get in again to the specifics, but basically, you know, psychotherapy is based on not avoiding, on exploring difficult subjects, things that we don't normally talk about, from sexuality to death to uh, relationships to uh, everything our primary family. It's an open space to do that. We survey problems, we develop a narrative, we help to develop meaning in the face of those things. And we identify a treatment together. So that's, we, we don't avoid. And then we activate resources. So we find meaning, we find supports, we rely on the therapist, we rely on that mental health provider, we have somebody accompanying us on that journey, and that's the therapeutic relationship, and that's what leads to such positive outcomes. All right. So. Um, we have about 15 to 20 minutes left. My hope actually is to have a fairly open conversation around screening, assessment, and referral uh, when it comes to mental health concerns. So I'll present just a little bit about the background, how distress screening is already being done here at the hospital um, in, the, in the oncology unit, uh, and a little bit about some of the recommendations from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. But I'm also just curious about how folks would see this uh, playing out for themselves. And maybe we can use the question time to talk about it as well. So uh, the stress, uh, National Comprehensive Cancer Network in 1997, said the number one reason psychological domain not better integrated into cancer care, stigma, right? We don't want to talk about mental illness. We don't want to even imply that our patients might have a mental health concern. So as a result of that, we generally, they generally suggested that we should use the term distress. And I actually am a big proponent of that. I really like this idea of using distress. Uh, it's a, it's a, a great way to get folks in the door. It, it's not very specific. You know, we have all in the big diagnostic criteria, you know, around uh, anxiety disorders, major depression, all those things. The stress doesn't appear anywhere um, because the stress isn't a very specific term but it captures a wide array of people's experiences that can then get them into the door for further assessment and screening. So distress is sort of the preferred term, 
And in 2004, it was named the sixth vital sign, along with pain as the fifth and the typical four vital signs. Um, distress sort of just captures this experience of being overwhelmed, of feeling exhausted, of getting towards breakdown. Certainly, a little stress in our lives is important. This is the yerkes dodson curve. You know, a little stress helps increase performance, but when stress gets to be at high levels for extended periods, we, we get to break down exhaustion. So, and distress screening is becoming more and more common. Uh, so about 70% of uh, NCCN institutions conduct distress screenings. Um, and that's higher than the general uh, population of, of uh, oncology care, cancer care. So one recommendation is to use very, very, very short screenings, uh, the distress thermometer. And what ultra short screening, so the distress thermometer is just this little thermometer that you rate from zero to 10. Um, as a psychologist, we have something called the MMPI, which is 400 questions. Uh, and the MMPI is a very thorough personality assessment. The, dis the distress thermometer is a thermometer. Um, so there's a dif difference there. But ultra short screenings are very, very useful for a couple of reasons. One is they generally good at excluding possible diagnoses. So they're good at uh, excluding the fact that somebody doesn't have depression. So if you're worried about a patient that might have a mental health concern, you give them a distress thermometer, and they will, it's a pretty good job at determining if the patient isn't depressed or isn't anxious. It's not super great at about confirming a diagnosis, right? So just because they're at above a certain threshold, it's not 100% that they are depressed or anxious. But if you're worried about a patient, if you're wondering about if this patient might be experiencing mental health concern, the, something very short like the distress thermometers can, can be very useful. And given that a false positive, like uh, identifying somebody as maybe having depression when they don't, pretty low risk phenomenon. They get referred to me, maybe they have to talk to me for 45 minutes. And um, I mean, that, you know, that, that's a side effect, an adverse side effect, but not the worst thing maybe. Um, in their, in their lives. OK. So basically, the COC guidelines say, uh, and we're already doing this here, uh, you know, at one pivotal medical, pivotal medical visit, either post-surgical, post chemotherapy discussion, routine visit, et cetera, that distress screening should happen at least one time. Um, we, that tool is selected and approved. And if there's evidence of moderate or severe distress, the a patient of the oncology team should assess some of these uh, further components. Those things should be documented in the medical record. Uh, and somebody should be kind of generally keeping an eye on things to make sure that the number of patients screened, the number of patients referred, and the number of patients, uh, the number of patients referred for distress follow-up, and the number of patients referred for, thir for their services is sort of kept track of. So how might this look in the, the clinic? So for example, the distress thermometer. What is typically used as a cutoff is a score of four or greater. Uh, that triggers further assessment and allows for a brief discussion of concerns. It also is accompanied by a checklist that allows the patient to kind of just note which areas might be concerning to them. Um, one way to introduce this, if you're not sure, uh, is to just sort of say, first of all, to just really, really normalize this, right? We already looked at the prevalence rates of major depression, of adjustment disorders, 20 times, 40 times higher um, than the general population. It's just really normalizing the likelihood of this occurring. You know, one thing we know about cancer treatment is it can be fairly stressful for many folks. Would you mind filling out this questionnaire that asks about how you're doing overall and any concerns you might have? Once you finish it, we can chat about it, OK? So let's go back to uh, Beth. Um, Beth has been feeling a little panicked, a little depressed, a little fatigued. Uh, she's really worried about the, the consequences of her chemotherapy treatment. Um, she's really worried about her ability to manage her anxiety. She's had a, a few panic attacks in the past that were pretty scary for her, um, that she's never really gotten treated. And she's feeling pretty down. She's worried about letting her husband down. She's worried about letting her, her children down. So she scores a, a six, and she checks off panic, depression, and fatigue. OK. So what do we do next in the room? Open-ended questions, by far the best skill. Open-ended questions are things that can't be answered with a yes or a no. So, Beth, I noticed you circled a six on the scale, which tells me you're feeling pretty distressed. I also see that you check panic, depression, and fatigue. 
Uh, one of my favorite questions is, what would you say is, is bothering you the most? So you can sort of start, you know, in terms of the HPI, they're presenting illness, you can start with the most important, most salient for this, this patient. Uh, what would you say is, is bothering you the most? And allow them to just sort of uh, ventilate a little bit about their concerns. And then asking if anything is left out, can you tell me a little bit more about X, a little bit more about Y? Here, basically, as much time as you have available for basic support uh, exploration is useful. And then finally, if you're getting a sense that this is somebody who might benefit, um, and I'm happy to answer questions about that sort of decision point for folks, uh, but if you're getting a sense that this is somebody who might benefit from therapy, you can say there's a lot of services that we have that can help. Many persons find help in talking to a psychologist can be quite effective. Can we look at some options for you today? So basically just saying that this is standard care, right? This is what we're doing right now with this thermometer. This is standard care. This is a part of treatment, the biopsychosocial approach. We're not gonna just focus on um, the biological illness, but we'll also focus on the psychosocial aspects and really normalize that. And if you have something that you wanna say that it can be individually tailored around why therapy would be beneficial, right? So, you know, Beth, you, re you really told me about fears about letting down your, your, your family. And a psychologist can really talk with you kind of be an open sounding board for how to talk to your family about these concerns. Um, and that can really, uh, it can also give you specific skills in managing anxiety, uh, stress reduction, those sorts of things. All right, so right now, and I'll leave it here, this is sort of the process we have. We have uh, the cancer care navigators here with us who can help talk about this process as well. But right now, basically, we're providing the contact information for the, the psychologist, the CRC uh, uh, contact info to patients. We have brochures that you can hand to patients. Um, but you can also, even better than that, is maybe walk them over. Uh, right now, we have a psychologist in, my, myself in on Fridays, and we have a, a doctoral student in on Thursdays uh, where we can make that warm handoff. Um, or if, if neither of us are available, you can even just talk to the, to the staff over at the Cancer Resource Center um, to give them a sense of where they're going and where this is gonna happen. Eventually, we hope to have this through Epic so that you can just make a psych order, a consult order. Um, but at that point, we're still, we're still working on that process, so. All right, so the overall take homes from today, you know, is basically that behavioral psychosocial factors really do contribute to the incidence, uh, screening, treatment, and outcomes uh, in cancer care, but also in other uh, diseases. The stress screening is a great sort of thin edge of the wedge. It's a way of getting folks into the door. Uh, for further uh, assessment and treatment. And to the extent that we feel comfortable talking about these issues with our patients is likely the extent to which they're gonna get referred and assessed uh, for needed treatments. Right, so that's all I have. I'm hopeful to, to answer questions that uh, you all have and help kind of generate some discussion here. Yeah. Hey, I got the mic right by me. Um, so I was thinking when you were making very compelling arguments that for <laughs> me, the most compelling thing was to actually go get psychotherapy. So yeah. I, I'm a beneficiary of it. Yes. And it really broke down the barrier for having these conversations. Yeah. So I would, you know, I strongly believe everybody could use a little bit of help in this yeah, part of their yeah. world. And I know if if anybody in the audience thinks that they're too perfect to need help <laughs> yeah. then send your spouse but somebody <laughs> somebody exactly. that you know you know could really break down that barrier yeah, just to yeah. comment more than a question and maybe you could validate it I don't no know. no absolutely and that's you know my own personal experience in seeking counseling and getting support at different times in my life i think helps to uh we we're not immune to the stigma as providers right we we're still a part of the general population in terms of our the social attitudes around mental health. So to the extent that we experience it for ourselves and can destigmatize mental illness and mental health treatment is likely the extent to which we can talk openly to our patients. So I'm so glad that you're willing to do that because that is really what's gonna get folks motivated. Yeah, there's one here and then, yeah. Okay, so I too think that what you're doing is great and the CRCs are helping one of my patients even that went home yesterday from the hospital. But one thing I was gonna ask, like if you think that there's family members that yeah. could benefit too, can you ask to, for it to be, because sometimes it's the family members yeah, that are yep. creating the yep. tornado around them. Yeah, um, absolutely. So can they do family counseling? Yeah, like, yeah. Like together? Yep, yep. So we do offer that at the, as and psychologists have varying degrees of specialization or training in family therapy. It is something that I have training on when I was on internship and have some good background in. So it's definitely a referral that I'm happy to work with families 
So you um, just and I do work with and, like, and talk to so and so too. Like, yeah, you can refer the family with them. So typically, yeah, and that's a, it's a complicated process, and um, we we talk about confidentiality and how to manage that. But if it's a whole family that's being referred and not a patient, kind of individually, mm -hmm. then the, the the family is sort of the the patient when it comes to family therapy, and you treat them as a unit. Um, whereas sometimes you might treat an individual family member and then bring in a spouse or bring in uh, uh, someone else as that person would like to, sort of as a collateral. But yeah, so family therapy is something we can offer. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Um, I, I just, are you pointing? Can I? Oh, sorry, yeah. I'm not <laughs> sure. You're looking over yeah. there. I don't want to hear, so. <laughs> sorry, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask real quick about um, how uh, mental health services, maybe both in general and also specifically in our institution, are, yeah. are paid for and funded and the availability and the yeah, yeah. access that people have because that seems like a big problem, both in access to qualified providers like yourself and coverage, not having parity in yeah, insurance no, and insurance and that sort of issue. It's a, it's a huge issue. Right now, the, my position is supported by the foundation, and so it is a free service to patients. Um, that might not be the case for every, if we, I don't know how it'll move forward around those things, but certainly it, it's a barrier, uh, is the affordability of care and services. Um, right now, I feel very fortunate to be supported by the foundation to be here um, so that we can offer that service to families, but it, it's, it sort of depends on how that gets navigated, I suppose. Does that answer your question, or? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So generally, and it depends on the insurance provider, but generally copays are around can be around twenty five dollars. Um, and depending on the level of the service provider, so you know, psychologists bill more than a social worker, etc. Um, so that's a consideration as well. Um, yeah. Yep. So this kind of builds off what Brenda was uh, <clears throat> just asking. Yeah. So if you have an individual who is uh, uh, being sort of destroyed by a family member, yeah. Uh, and the family member doesn't want to come in. Yeah. And the family member is the one that has the problems. Mm -hmm. How does that work? I mean, what do you would you have any suggestions? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a good. It's a very good po question. And typically, what? So what I do would work, typically I would work with the individual, the, the person who is, uh, even though it's likely not that person, it sounds like in this dynamic uh, that that person is to blame necessarily for what's going on. However, it is usually, you can support the person in that process of making decisions of what to do with their spouse. Um, of course, there's limitations around if there's violence involved, um, at which point that makes some different decisions around um, treatment, but you can still, and if it, I mean, if it's a independent adult, an adult person, they can make decisions for themselves about leaving a relationship or that sort of thing. But I would still usually work with the person who, the patient themselves. Yeah. Not worry about trying to get the uh, right. party there. If, yeah, and it, it totally depends on the, the specifics, I would, I suppose. But if at some point, usually what can happen is there's role plays or ways of practicing. What, what can I say to my partner? What am I going to do? How am I going to keep myself safe? Um, how do we engage in this relationship? Um, sometimes I will bring, if they wanted, they can bring their partner into the room as a sort of collateral, and we can work together unless there's violence or danger, at which point I wouldn't welcome uh, that person into the room. Yeah. Uh, I have a question uh, uh, about the same as what Shane just asked yeah. about the payment. Um, yep. You know, the. The fact that Mary Greeley has a foundation is obviously a very good thing because yeah. um, this is not just in psychology, but in actually any inpatient Medicare uh, services or any Medicaid inpatient services. The payments are so low now that the hospital has to subsidize our hospitalist program because they are not paid enough to take care of these patients. They would not be here unless Mary Greeley actually subsidized them. Yeah. And this is happening in a lot of other specialties too. Um, so I think that the, the general public really doesn't have any idea that uh, physicians are not going to continue doing these services unless they're somehow subsidized either by some foundation or by the hospital making some 
money in certain areas, but losing money in other areas. And obviously mental health has been a money loser for Mary Greeley for a long time. But at least the foundation is willing to help out and we have some generous people that are you know, donating to the foundation. Yeah, there. yeah. And I think it's just, we have to think about prioritizing these things and you're pointing out, you know, as, as we talked about, the psychosocial factors are so crucial to the development and maintenance of physical health conditions. And so it's, yeah, it's a, such a valid point, prioritizing. Yeah. I do apologize for missing the first part of the talk. Uh, what I caught was uh, very interesting. I have observed in my partner's CF patients that getting that catastrophic disease seems to lead to a rapid sprint to adulthood and a lot of very uh, ill-advised behaviors for a child that all of a sudden sees the arc of their life much differently. Right. I wonder if you see that in other, you know, ominous disease processes. I have yeah. a firsthand experience with a, a, a diagnosis of MS not going real well yeah. uh, with a family member of mine. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it just kind of rocks their world so much they make maybe bad choices. Wondered if you had thoughts. Right. Um, I, I'll just say some what, what's coming to mind, and I'll be curious to hear other thoughts as well. But uh, so much of it is about the ability for networks, social networks, to handle that diagnosis and for that person to really get supports and discuss this the reality that they're now facing. Right. I think you're talking about. Uh, death anxiety, terror management. Um, Actually, I'm talking about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Okay. <laughs> so you're talking about some real behavioral issues, which maybe actually, if you want to talk to the rock stars, there's probably some terror management that's going on, but we won't get into that, some death anxiety that's going on. But um, the, why I think it's important, or what, what is important in this process is the ability to, to talk about those, the things that are going on for them so that they don't turn to coping skills that are perhaps less adaptive for various reasons. And that's where therapy can be useful. Um, but yeah, I, no, I definitely observed that. But there's, and, and in terms of this uh, opportunity to feel both extreme overwhelm and then avoid that overwhelm feelings and turn to these other things or to look it in the face and have support as I do so to feel more auth uh, authentic living. Um, and that is really mediated by the presence of attachment figures, people in our lives, yeah. 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 Right. Ah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the question is sort of about the effectiveness of psycho-oncology for uh, a cancer diagnosis at different stages of life, devel developmentally. Um, I'm not aware of any differences in psychotherapy effectiveness between ages um, that develop, you know, I work across the lifespan. We're trained as sort of generalists, so we do work across the lifespan. Um, and I'm not aware of any differential sort of effectiveness of psychotherapy. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll look into that just in case. <laughs> Nothing's coming to mind, but yeah, it's a good question. Great. Well, thank you all for, for coming. It's very uh, great to get to know you all, yeah. Always happy to answer questions afterward as well.